1 Corinthians chapter 13. It was read earlier, verses 11 through 13, and I'm going to talk to you this morning about three marks of spiritual influence, three marks of spiritual influence, and uh, just at the beginning, as you're trying to find your page there, 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, beginning in verse number 11, uh, if you have something to write with, or you have a piece of paper, maybe it's the bulletin, you have, uh, there's a note section of bulletin, uh, what I'd like you to do is uh, draw a circle in your note somewhere, draw a circle on a piece of paper, and because uh, I'm going to use it as an illustration for you personally, as we talk about your sphere of influence, and uh, as you're getting that settled, uh, when you think of influence, what comes to mind? Perhaps a teacher, a parent, a coach, what about you? the common Joe or the common Josephine in our community? How can you influence others for the cause of Jesus Christ? So what is your sphere of influence? Who do you come in contact with on a daily basis or a monthly basis or even perhaps yearly that you know that you have a voice with them, you have an influence in their life? For my lesson, I will relate to, to those who you come in contact with. What does your sphere of influence look like? It could be family, friends, co-workers, schoolmates, neighbors, periodic acquaintances, a store clerk, a service provider of some type, and I'm sure you can think of many more that you come in contact with from time to time. When I go to the doctor or when I go to the dentist and I visit with them, it's always uh, a quick time of them saying, well, how are the kids and how's the wife, and they do a quick checkup. And, and, uh, and so over the years, I've just learned to take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, when they ask personal questions, I get to ask personal questions. And so I ask them, how's your wife and how are your kids? And, and uh, where do you go to church? And sometimes the answer is, oh, we don't. And I say, and they, many of them now know that I'm a pastor. And, but even before that, I would just let them know that I was a Christian. And I would tell them a little about my life. And sometimes that opened up great conversations. Sometimes that's the only thing they remember when I come back in the office about who I am. And, uh, and so it's, a, it's an opportunity for you, even with periodic acquaintances, to perhaps get a word in about Christ, to perhaps just demonstrate something about Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to focus on here today, is how can we be an influence to others in regards to our faith in Jesus Christ? And so three marks of this spiritual influence I find here in 1 Corinthians in chapter number 13. But I want to go ahead and have you on that piece of paper, if you want to save some room there, draw a circle and uh, as I was thinking through this, I was thinking people may have many different circles. A circle is a sphere, uh, and uh, you may have to label each one for a different category. I was, I was going to just say do a, a big circle and in there see how many of these different categories you can get in there. Talking about the sphere of influence of your family, the sphere of influence of your friends, your coworkers. We can go on and on down the list. So. If you want to put five circles, you can, but I'm just doing that as an object lesson for you as you're sitting there in your seat. Who do you know that you have influence with? And most of you, your family for sure, in some way, shape, or form. Maybe it's friendships, coworkers. Uh, on and on we could go with the list, as I've mentioned already uh, a number of times. And so think about that as we're going through this lesson. Who do you have influence with? And so as we look here, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 11 I want you to know prior to reading this again that uh, this is a continuation of thought from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and it doesn't finish the thought until 1 Corinthians chapter 14. The Apostle Paul was writing to speak to the Corinthian church, which was a, a newer church. They had a lot of issues in this church. There were people that are coming out of paganism, getting saved. They didn't understand what it was like to live the Christian life. They didn't understand uh, about spiritual gifts, and that's really the context here. Chapter 12, 13, and 14, Paul's talking about the use or misuse of spiritual gifts. What was the purpose? What's the intention of those spiritual gifts for people who are now in God's church, and how do you use those, and, and how does this all work out? And so I don't want to go into a message on spiritual gifts because I want to focus on these marks of spiritual influence. But let me just give you the background of spiritual gifts. In chapter 12, in verse number 1, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts. So we know that this is the context. Paul is talking about spiritual gifts. Our day and age has confused the idea of spiritual gifts. Uh, when 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and 14 kind of tackle one of the most misused or misunderstood spiritual gifts, that of speaking in tongues. Tongues in the scriptures 
The speaking of tongues were known languages. Acts chapter 1 and 2 clearly tell us that, clearly indicate this was so. There are people today that think that their tongue, the speaking in an unknown tongue, is how they communicate, pray to God. Well, Paul kind of settles that in chapter number 14 by going back to the original use of, of, of the spiritual gifts. That's only one spiritual gift, folks. And sometimes people focus in on only one thing and not the things that tend to give the most credit to God's work. And that's what Paul was doing in chapter 13. He was saying, here's the most important gift. If there's going to be a gift, here's the most important gift for you to focus on. And so again, I'm not getting into a whole lecture on spiritual gifts. We'll save that for another time. But I want you to notice, first of all, here in verses 4 through 6 of chapter 12, he says, relating in verse 1, that it's about spiritual gifts. Now there are diversities of what? Gifts, but the same Spirit. Talking about the Holy Spirit of God. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but the same God, which worketh all in all. So here we have that the spiritual gifts are related to God's purpose and God's work. It is His desire that He equips His believers with a spiritual gift to be used. And now we're going to understand how they are to be used. So notice with me in verse number 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. Now that would be every saved man or woman. Everyone that comes to Christ, that comes, becomes a new believer. God is giving to every one of them a spiritual gift to be used. Notice what the next three words are. To profit with all. So the idea for a spiritual gift is not selfish in motivation. The idea of a spiritual gift is not for me to be edified personally. Spiritual gift is for me to be used to profit with all, the whole congregation of the church. Now that may be a behind the scenes. You say, well, how could I behind the scenes use my spiritual gift to affect the whole church? Uh, we'll go back to the illustration of first through sixth grade Sunday school teachers. Are they not having an effect on the whole church by training our children the Word of God? Absolutely they are. They're giving mom and dad the opportunity to come here teaching on their level. They're giving now children the ability to, to learn in just a short amount of time lessons of the Word of God and, and influence them, perhaps even come to know Christ at a young age, which then eventually will affect the whole entire church, maybe even beyond our church. And so, yes, spiritual gifts, depending if it's a teacher, a helps, gift of helps, Many different types of service gifts are used to profit the entire church, not to be a selfish motivation, although it does be benefit us to use those gifts to honor God. So it's for His work, it's for our profit in totality of the whole congregation. It's also used for harmony in the church. If you notice in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, go down to verse number 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 12, for, the, for as the body is one and hath many members, and all members of that one body being many are one body, so is also is Christ. Here's the idea. As you look at a human body, we have eyes, we have ears, we have a nose, we have a mouth, we have arms, we have hands, we have legs, we have feet. Those are the members of our body physically. Paul, as he's writing, is using a great object, object lesson. He says, so also is Christ's church that there are many different members, now individuals. God has equipped all of you that are saved with a spiritual gift. That gift now is to be used to profit the whole body of Christ. Does that make sense? And I'm not going into the details here, but there's much more to it. But that's, that's the, the nutshell. That's what you need to understand about your spiritual gift being used to profit the whole uh, congregation. And so what we find then as we move forward now is that in chapter 13... Paul is accentuating the best gift. He's trying to help them understand, here are the marks that you need to understand will influence others for the cause of Christ. Notice in verse number 11 now, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man or when I grew up, I put away what? Childish thing. Now, some of us as adult grown men, we still like our toys, do we not? Come on, men. Oh, yeah. We like our toys. We like having fun. We like going out and doing what we used to do as kids. I will still go on the floor and play with little green army men. Absolutely. You bring out a bag of little green army men, I'm on the floor. I'm setting up teams, and I'm going to get a tennis ball or something and knock over the other side. I'm in it. You bring out matchbox cards. I'm there. I want to play with matchbox cards. I go back in my brain to when I was a kid and playing with those things. Tonka truck, you bet. I'll go out in the sandlot. I'll play in the sandlot. 
move the, t I'll make roads, I'll tell kids, get out of the way, I'm gonna make a road for you. <laughs> if you don't like my road, then we're gonna have to wrestle, all right? Because <laughs> I'm a big kid at heart, I love playing with childish things, kid things, but we're, we know we're talking also, Paul's using this illustration, hey, we understand there's a natural uh, process of life, we're gonna grow up and eventually we're not gonna be doing the same things all the time that we did as kids, we're now gonna be maturing. And he's talking about this spiritually. And in reference here, he's talking about the need for them to understand. Back in verse number 8 and 9, he's saying, uh, in verse number 8, Charity never faileth, love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether it be knowledge, it shall vanish away. He's now making a clear distinction about those practicing sign gifts. There was going to come a time when these sign gifts that were used so well by the apostles and by Jesus Christ will come to an end. And then it's focusing on the best gifts. And Paul nails it as love and prophecy. Not prophecy telling something that's not known. Prophecy as far as teaching. Specifically, teaching the truths of the Word of God. So again... We can debate this another time, but I want to get into the main part of this message. Notice verse number 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I, put, I, I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am. Known. In other words, there's going to come a day where God's going to totally illumine our hearts and minds. We're going to see him face to face. He's going to help everything to become so crystal clear to us. But right now, in the meantime, he's given us information to help us to just go the next step. Just like a flashlight only shines so far. God has given us enough information to say, here's what I want you to be faithful with as one of my followers on earth at this time. You have just enough light to get you the next step. Just enough light to get you the next step. Just enough light. That's all God wants you. Just be faithful with what he's given to you now. And so now let's get into these three different marks of spiritual influence. Number one, verse number 13. And now abideth, what's the word? Faith. faith. Now abideth faith. Faith is a conviction of truth. A conviction of truth. As a believer, I am called to demonstrate my faith to others. As a believer in Jesus Christ, I am called to demonstrate my faith to others. I know that very clearly the scriptures teach in, in many different portions, but the most famous one is Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, where it very clearly says that every disciple that comes after the apostles, that they lead to Christ, every disciple all the way down to our day is supposed to teach what Jesus taught to others. Saved or unsaved, we're to teach people the gospel. If they get saved, we're to baptize them. If they get baptized, we're to keep discipling them, training them to do exactly what we're doing. That's Bible, folks. That's how we demonstrate our faith to others. Because a faith that is hidden is really not faith. You say, well, what, what, what do you mean? A faith that is hidden is not real faith. I'm not, saying, I'm not trying to get you to question your salvation. I'm just saying nobody knows about it. Your faith is to be used in action so others can see a change in your life. Many of us, after we got saved, we went back to our old friends. After a while, God grooming us and changing us. Went back and visited relatives, and they say, what's different about you? For me, they said, you're just nice now. <laughs> well, thanks a lot. I, what did that mean? You didn't like, we put up with you before, but now you're really nice. What's, and, and it came to grips that, Wow. God is changing me from the inside out. I wasn't trying. That was just God working in my hard heart and changing me. That's what God does once you come to know him as your personal savior. And he can start changing you from the inside out. And so we're to demonstrate our faith. Notice what James says in James chapter 2, verses 14 to 20. I won't turn there, but you can if you like to. I'm just going to read a couple excerpts. James was given this illustration about I will show you my faith by my works. Now, we don't believe in a works-based salvation, meaning you work to get to heaven. We believe you get saved by faith through grace of trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. But then, that faith should now be demonstrated by serving Christ, by working. It doesn't mean that if you don't do exactly what I do, you're not saved. I'm not saying that. Don't misunderstand. But James made it a key point saying, listen, you tell me by just verbally that you're a person of faith, he said, I'll do more than that. Not only will I say it verbally, but I'm also going to act it out. I'm going to live the Christian life. I'm going to go to church faithfully. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to tell people about my Savior. I'm going to get involved in Sunday school. I'm going to get involved in community groups. I'm going to get involved in connection. I'm going to do 
what Christians do to get God's word out there so others can have the same joy of coming to Christ as I do. That's a demonstration of faith. That's a mark of spiritual influence. And this is something, a key that, that James understood and Paul and all the apostles and many of us and many of our, our forefathers understood. Let me read you a quote. True faith is in the vocabulary of Christians is not only belief and trust, but also faithfulness and loyalty. Put technically and linguistically, faith is both active and passive in sense. It is not only the inspiration of all religion, but is also a moral excellence. We have to understand that faith is more than just saying, I believe. Faith that is actualized in our life, faith that is real in our life, acts out. I am different because of the faith I received of Jesus Christ. I act differently because Jesus came in, changed this wicked person into now a spiritual person, not perfect by any means, still have flaws, but he started changing me from the inside out. And now I put that faith into action so that others can see Christ in me. Not, not because I'm going around bragging, because I am giving a task to live my faith out in the community, to let others know that I'm not ashamed of my Savior, Jesus Christ. Matthew 5, 14, Ye are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. God doesn't want you to hide your faith. He doesn't want to have secret service Christians. You understand that? He wants you out and about. He wants you to be proud about who you are in Him and not be ashamed of telling people, look, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. He changed me. I am so thankful He changed me. I'm not ashamed of it. And I'm not saying go and be the, your work evangelist, okay? They didn't hire you for that. But in opportunities and, and right amount of time, maybe on a lunch break, maybe after work, maybe invitation somewhere, no problem. But don't use work time to be the preacher of, of, of your workplace, okay? That's not what you're paid for. The best testimony you give there is work hard, be honest, be honorable, do a good solid day's work, and your, your witness may have more effect because people say, what's different about you? Man, you don't do what you used to do. You've changed. Why are you working so hard? Why are you, are you just brown nosing? You're going to get all kinds of criticisms. But when you just start living like Christ wants you to live, people start taking notice. They say, okay, something's different. And it might open up an opportunity for you to say, listen, I'm no different than you, but God changed me, and I just want to live for him now. What a great testimony. What a way to demonstrate faith to the community. Secondly, I want you to notice that not only is a, uh, one of the marks of spiritual influence a demonstration of faith, but notice again in our text, and now abideth faith. What's the next one? Hope. Hope is another way that we demonstrate uh, the qualities of, of spiritual influence to our community. Now abideth hope. Hope is joyful expectation. Joyful expectation based on a fact that we know that we're saved, we know that we're going to heaven. I live now expectant that someday God's either going to take me through the rapture or I'm going to go to the grave and I know where I'm going when I die. Several years ago, I went to the doctor and he said, you got high cholesterol. And I said, okay. He wanted to put me on drugs. I said, nope, I'll give me, give me another way of doing it. I'll, I'll exercise, I'll eat right, I'll do all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and so he made a comment. And I said, listen, doc, I'm not afraid of dying. And he just looked at me with this look like, you're an idiot. <laughs> it's the same look I get from my wife all the time. <laughs> and I just told him, I said, Doc, I know I'm going to heaven when I die. He said, John, you got a family. I said, okay, right, now you bring the family until I, get, I hear you. But, but I, I was just trying to make a statement to him that I understand what's going on in my body, but I also will do my best to change this naturally. If I can't, I'll get on your drugs, but right now, I'm good. And so, I've been working on it very hard, but anyways, uh, that, I digress. The idea there was, he actually was stumped that somebody would say to him, Doc, I'm not afraid of dying. He deals with people that get bad news all the time. And he said, they're fearful. I said, but I'm just not. I just know that I know that I know when I die, I know where I'm going. It doesn't mean I want to hurry it up. But at the same time, I just know I have confidence. I know what's going to happen to me. And so I believe with all my heart that I have a joyful expectation I'll be with, with Christ in heaven. Turn with me real quickly to Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter number 5. Notice what it says here, verses 1 and following. 
Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein ye stand. And rejoice in what? Hope of the glory of God. Of God, We rejoice in hope of the glory of God, meaning in the purpose of God, that God wants us to be glorified with Him. Isn't that good? God wants you to be with Him in heaven for eternity. He doesn't want you to die and go to hell. He doesn't want you to live a miserable life. He doesn't want you to just hope that you get through this life somehow by wishing. He wants you to have an expectation that, no doubt about it, because of your faith in Jesus Christ, He's changed you on the inside that you have a joyful expectation that someday you'll get to see him face to face. God loves you that much. He wants to give you that expectation. And it's something that you can have on a daily basis no matter what you're going through. But because of spiritual renewal, hope is demonstrated in trials. Some of you, as I mentioned earlier, I have learned so much from some of you. It's, it's easy for us to go through the short-term trials. And I say easy. Some are harsh and hard. But once you get through it, you say, okay, that's over. But for those of you who have been going through months, years, multiple years of trials, to me, you're heroes. Because you still come to church with a joy. You still come to church saying, I know God's in charge. As hard as this is, I just know God's in charge. Someday, he's going to make sense. Folks, if you've not been through a long term, long, with no idea when this is going to end, some know that it won't end for them until death. And yet they still have hope in God. That's amazing. That, those are the people who should be our heroes of the faith. Those are the people we should look to and say, what's the secret? And the secret is, when you're in the trial, putting into practice their faith and trusting God because of the hope that's inside of them. And that just doesn't come because you pray a prayer. That becomes because you walk with God and understand his purposes for you. And only those who are in that can understand that fully. We can talk about it, but we don't understand it like they do. And when you go through those long-term, very difficult times, and you have to have those meetings with God that nobody wants to have, but then he reassures you that he's in charge, those are the people that you say, okay, you're on a whole different level, whole different level than the rest of us. Because you're, you understand joyful expectation. Even if you don't see it right now, you can see the future that you'll get a reprieve someday when it's all over. Those are amazing people in my book. And hope maketh not ashamed, verse number 5. Romans 5, 5. Oh, let me go back to verse number 4. And patience, experience, and experience, hope. Romans 5, 4 and 5. And hope maketh not ashamed. What does that mean? It means the confidence that we have in our saving grace of Jesus Christ gives us such an expectation that I know that heaven is my home. When someone questions me about my faith, I don't have to shy away. Well, you're a Christian. Well, yeah, yeah, we go to church. Say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Are you a Christian? That's not the answer you get from a lot of Christians. A lot of Christians shy away from it. The boss talks to you, you know, he's an avowed atheist. The, somebody at work who sits in the cubicle next to you is someone who's against religion. I've had it all. I've worked secular field many years. I was never ashamed of my Savior. And I would say, hey, if you want to talk sometime, let me know. No, that's okay, John. Okay. And then others say, yeah, I'd like to talk about it. All right, what are you doing after work? And sometimes like, yeah, maybe I don't want to talk to you. Once, you. once you get them on the line, they're like, mm, maybe not. But others have said, yeah. I was like, hey, you can come to my church. You can hear what they have to say. I said, but if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer your questions. And sometimes people have asked me specific questions. And I've gone home, done studies for them, brought it back, gave it to them. And sometimes they're just throwing it right in the trash. I'm like, okay, that was a couple hours of work. Other times they said, thank you. And they actually listened and met up with them another time. And they listened to the gospel and they got saved. You just never know who you're going to come in contact with. But don't be ashamed of your faith. You, if you have hope in Jesus Christ and assured expectation because he's changed you, what a blessing that is. Notice in verses 6 through 10 the contrast. From those who have hope in Christ because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Notice verses 6 through 10 and I'll just the highlights. 
For when we were yet without strength, meaning that we were without Christ, we were not saved. We had no hope of eternity. So he, he indicates here that before Christ, before Jesus changing us inside, we were without strength. Verse number 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one, per adventure, one die. Per adventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. In other words, you had no friends. No genuine friend that would lay their life down for you. That, not talking about it in a secular way that guys in the military lay their life down for a buddy. Not talking about that. He's talking about spiritually. There was no hope for you spiritually. We also see here that it mentions verse number 8. But God commendeth, demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners. Before we got saved, God saw us as sinners. That's it. You're a sinner. You're against him. He loved you, but he saw you as a sinner. Notice what it says in verse number 9. He says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath. Before you got saved, you were under God's wrath. Didn't even know it. The day you would die, if you never got saved, would be the day you'd enter into hell. God knew that about you. And he wanted you to escape that. That's why he sent his son to die in your place. You can't die in your own place. Only Jesus can die for you. And then verse number 10, for if when we were enemies, before you got saved, you were enemies of God. Now, most people out there, they don't want to admit that. No, 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 I'm a good person. Yeah, I get that. Amongst humans, you probably are a good person. But in the eyes of God, you need to understand his perspective. You don't become one of his children until you trust Jesus Christ and you ask him to forgive your sins and you get saved, get delivered from your sin debt. So we were without strength, without hope. We were sinners, under wrath, enemies of God. Hope rejoices in Jesus, our expectation and deliverer. Notice verse number 10, or verse number 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Here, meaning the reconciliation, being redeemed, being bought back by God. Why? Through Jesus Christ, when you trust him. And lastly, the demonstration of love. Verse number, back in our text, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, the word is charity, which is agape love. It's affectionate. It means affection or benevolence. God loved you enough to die in your place. But notice here that it mentions that we can demonstrate love to our unsaved family, friends, whatever your sphere of influence is. Matthew 24, 12, though on a negative note, mentions this. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. You, don't want to want, you want to know why people are so mean-spirited? Because they don't have the love of Christ in them. You can blame them. You can say that's just a mean person. But it's because they do not have the love of Christ. You have to look beyond their attitude. And you need to see a heart that Jesus died for. They just don't know it yet. Let people be mean to you. And pray for him. See, that's love in action. That's hard, though. In my flesh, I want to be just mean back at them. In my flesh, I want to push them back. I want to say horrible things. To them. In my flesh, because I'm human. But in my spirit, I know that that is because they do not know Jesus the way I know them. And I want them to come to know Christ. So I'm willing to take a few hits. Give them some time. Give them some space. But say, you know what? I'll be praying for you. And pray that God will do something to get them to realize that he truly does love them. Because I can't change them, only God can. And so the demonstration of love. Your ability to influence others by genuine love will be more obvious in cold world tainted with sin. In a world tainted with sin, your genuine acts of love will go so much farther if it's genuine. If it's genuine. John 5, 36 through 43, I'll just read verse 42. It says, I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. Why? Their actions, their attitude, their pride demonstrated differently. He was talking to the Pharisee. He was talking to the Jews who were so against Jesus' ministry. And he knew that they were against him because they did not understand the love of God. Wow. It's not that people are against you being a Christian. They just don't understand the love of God. 
We need to educate them in the love of God. How? By giving them the gospel. They may at first time say, that's stupid. Tenth time, oh, that's crazy. You guys are all messed up. Well, it might be the twelfth time they say, you know what, something's true about that. Twentieth time they may just say, you know what, I need that in my life. We can, we can pull back or we can just keep being faithful. On a positive side, John 13, 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one to another, that's our theme verse for this year for being disciples. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you and I demonstrate love one to another, true, affectionate, benevolent love to one another, others will say, what's different about you? You know, I called you a blankety blank and you didn't respond that the same way to me. I wanted to, but you're right. God helped me not to at that moment. What, what's wrong with you? I, I don't get it. You know, everyone, you give, 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 and everyone just takes, 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 and you just keep giving. You just learn that when you're going to minister to people, it's just going to be more of a giving than a receiving ministry. But you know what the blessing is? I'd rather be on the giving side than on the receiving side. When you get to give, it's a blessing. It's a blessing to be able to give because you're looking at people... You know they don't understand what you're doing. But once in a while, you get a glimmer of hope that somebody gets it. And then once in a while, somebody will finally say, I understand it now. And they get saved and they start living for Christ. You're like, praise God, there's another one the devil doesn't get. Who knows who they'll influence? A demonstration of love. Let's go back to our text and I'll just conclude with this. The three marks of spiritual influence, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest is love. Notice what it says here in chapter 13, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now abideth faith, hope, charity, or love. These three, but the greatest of these, say with me, is charity or love. Apostle Paul said, above all the gifts, love is the most essential. When you demonstrate the love of God to others, it leaves a mark. Don't you want to have a sphere of influence that leaves a mark on others for the positive? They may think you're crazy. They may think you're nuts. They may think you're a doormat. They may Let Christ be seen in you. And you just never know when God's going to start using your illustration, your testimony to start bringing fruit in their life and allow them to finally break down and say, okay, what is it? Let God do that work. That's not our work. We just bring people to know him.